talking with uh, Brett McBride. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about uh, kind of what the fishing's been like here recently on NASFA 2020. So this is the second time you guys have been here, right? Um, well, this, I think there's a like fourth. Really? I think, yeah. Well, I think this is National Four, but we had the first year we came up here and it was, I think that's when we had Hilton and Savannah. Second year we came up here and it was just, it was just freezing cold weather. Never, didn't get anything. Yeah. We had a horrible trip. Um, and then it was last year we ended up with four. And then, no, it was our fourth. So we'll see. It's been a tough trip. Very tough trip. You know, we started down and in, in out, out of Brunswick, Georgia, and had a hard time getting a weather window down there. And we we ended up, I think, with four days of fishing, and we saw two sharks. Um, one of them had the bait in its mouth, and everything looked just right. But it got the hook back. I think it just never quite had the bait all the way in its mouth, and the hook was never quite in its mouth because it it had it brought the gear quite a ways down down current towards us, and then it had them chugging. But when uh, when I got the bait back. I mean, I saw the shark open, like make a big kind of twisted move, open its mouth. Is right when we got the hook back, and I fished those bite blockers. You know, something that stops them from being able to take it deep. It's part of our permitting, actually, that we put bite blockers of some kind on there. And sometimes it just stops them from taking it deep enough deep to even get the hook. The hook. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then they're swimming with it with a closed mouth, and then instead of like regulping, but that's just kind of, you know, we've we've come from a such scrutiny that we can't risk ever deep hooking a shark so where other people get to you know if, if one gets deep hooked no one would ever know and they don't they're not under scrutiny like we are so i just yeah. have to go through all kinds of stuff to make sure that doesn't happen and sometimes it means we missed the bite and then we had a second shark that showed up right behind the boat and the proper shark another 15 foot plus shark and um we had a bait in position right there next to the boat then we came and got back into position behind the boat on the contender and had a bait down and uh, feeling like we were going to get that shark and then we got bit right then off the side of the boat on the, the set of gear that was closest to the boat and uh, we're all okay so we pulled our bait went over there and thought we were going to have that white shark on and it ended up being a tiny little tiger shark came in and ate that bait was that and the uh, seven foot shark yeah seven foot tiger i didn't even I mean, he couldn't even get the whole bait in his mouth um, but uh, and that just took us out of the game, but then we never saw that white shark again, and never had a bait in the water for it because of that. So that was a bad timing. So a little bit of bad luck at the beginning, at the beginning of the trip, and then ever since then it's just been nonstop weather. I mean, we had really another eight-hour window of fishing yesterday was all we've seen. So and then now we're running from weather again, back on the inside here. But you know we got a super moon, and we're you know inside this channel and it's just smokes and we've got like a three and a half knot current that's pretty much unfishable and so we'll get a small weather window um, or tide window as it, as it slows down and switches but and that's how we ended up getting one shark right in here in our first year when we we're doing the same thing hiding from weather on the outside and trying to get someplace where we can you know bring people to and from the boat safely and comfortably yeah. um, how much do you think the uh, moon actually has in the movement of sharks and great whites especially oh i think it has a lot just like with most species of fish you know there's almost always some kind of uh, effect that, you know, that the moon has on uh, you know i've got my certain areas that are in certain parts of the moon that i i like to make sure that i am able to fish and, and where i want to be but it's it's very seldom that i and we, we fish for usually about a month or have a, an expedition for usually about a month so it's, i'm basically going to get all the the moon phase uh, and it's just the weather phases. It's like so okay, well, you can say, look at over over a course of time. It's like oh, these moon phases were the best. And you look at some of your trips and you go, well, we weren't even able to fish a lot of the other days, you know. So you got to take into account all those factors. But um, we're heading into a decent moon phase right now. But it's uh, it's the end of our trip and we're out of weather. I'm in the weather and weather and days. So I think we're kind of stuck right in here until the end. And well, what's it like uh, jumping off onto the platform? I heard uh, Christian told me earlier that. Usually, even in the cold weather, you're so pumped up with adrenaline, even though you're hopping in barefoot with blue jeans, that you're still just... Yeah, um, you know, I don't really enjoy it. <laughs> it's always so, so cold. Um, it just has to be done. You know, there's no other real easy way, because you can't push a rope, right? I mean, i I got to re redirect the rope, so i got to put it over that pin, and, and then i got to be there for the shark, so it has it gets re-centered on the platform. Otherwise, the scientists won't have access to it if it's up in the corner or up against the wall. 
Um, but it's always cold, and it, you know it, it doesn't hurt. You know, I land in water. It's not like I'm landing on the deck. Um, you know, so that, that's fairly easy. It's, it's mostly just the worst part. Actually, is getting like people ask me all the time, it's like why are you, why are you in a t-shirt and jeans? And I'm like, well, it's cold out for me to be you know fishing in shorts. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, I'm not going to wear a wetsuit all day, and I and put a, putting a wetsuit on while you're while you have a shark on and have all that going on is difficult too so it, I just end up just saying you know I can tolerate it for 15 minutes but when it gets real cold like when we were fishing up in, in uh, Canada and it's like 46 degree water and they were snapping up there and I was getting in a lot you know that you absolutely have to have a, a wetsuit on so I was taking yeah. you know and I have my I have a two piece I have a Farmer John um, with a, a, a vest top a hooded vest and if I just fill it with the you know hot condition you know been a uh, thermos full of hot water with conditioner in it yeah. and then just before I'm going to put it on I just douse my hole inside of my suit and I can slip it on pretty quick but being in that freezing air is worse than being in the freezing water um, because the air is like a lot of times you know, it's really cold and then yeah. the water would feel warmer like I, I've had it in Jacksonville when I it was like 31 degree air temperature that day and I I jumped in the water and it was I think it was high 50s and it felt like I was jumping in the jacuzzi and then I jumped, and then we came up out of the water, and then it just instantly started icing up. You know, oh, my man, hair man. was icing, and, and then I started getting hypothermic. That was that was bad. So that is I, terrible. I can't let that happen. I don't do that anymore. I mean, I, when, it, when it gets like that, usually my adrenaline takes me through it, and I don't even think about the cold until it's over. But um, there's, there's a point when that doesn't make any sense anymore. It seems like the older I get, the, uh, the more susceptible I am to cold. So We've been on every expedition, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, Since um, the beginning with what, Shark uh, Men? Yeah, me and Chris uh, founded this together pretty much. You know, we've been together for uh, over 20 years now, so I'm um, doing offshore adventures and ocean hunter and you know, traveling around fishing marlin and tournaments and all that stuff um, since way back. Um, so, you know, we did uh, all that and then just kind of turned into this, and so we did this together. So, yeah, I've uh, been on every trip. So what did you think about sharks? I mean, were you guys always interested in sharks, or did it just kind of... You see a deficit there and decided to... Yeah, to me, it's. Um, I've never been interested in fishing for sharks um, all throughout my entire career as a fisherman, charter fisherman, commercial fisherman, everything. I, um, you, know, I've, you know, sharks are interesting and neat sometimes. Big makos were interesting, and, um, but I never really focused on them. I didn't really see much point in it, but um, I'm much more of a tuna and marlin and game fish fisherman yeah. but, and a spear fisherman. Um, but, uh, you know, I just love the ocean. And uh, as I got older and older, um, doing things um, that were giving back to the ocean um, seemed to make more and more sense, especially when you have children and, and all that. And then I've already basically satisfied all my curiosities and bucket list stuff. You know, I'm, I don't really have that much desire to go catch a bunch more fish for myself. And I, I mean, I still love, you know, taking people out fishing and doing the charter thing where you get to see somebody else's. You know, Dreams face light up, yeah. I mean that's great, but e- but even then, um, that's still a little less fulfilling. And then you, you get an opportunity to, to do some real groundbreaking stuff and, and stuff that you think will make a difference. And, and just working with scientists was fun for me. I, I, I like learning. Both my parents were doctors, and we have a lot of doctors in my family and scientists. And so it, it was kind of just that um, conversation was good for me. Even going back home, talking with my parents and everybody else, they they liked what I was doing more. Um, than they did when I was just private yachting or, or commercial fishing. Yeah, more um, of an impact too. I yeah, guess yeah, and, and I think a lot of people look for something in their life to be fulfilling that way, and it's and it's not always easy to find. Yeah. You know, I got to consider myself fortunate that um, that I have something that's that is you know, that fills that for me. So. so, any of the young kids out there that are you know wanting to get into the shark industry and kind of do what you do, what would what kind of advice? Not even in that industry specifically, but what would you, what advice would you give somebody that's young now? Um, I, the one thing I say to anybody who's young is just develop a work ethic. Um, you know, it's the, the people who work on, on this boat, and the, there's a lot of people who want to do stuff, and there's, you know, each one of my crew is just um, from a different walk of life, and I just mostly, I don't, I'm not looking for somebody who's a great fisherman or anything like that, because it's such a, it's such a unorthodox style, we're not, you know, rod and reel fishing, we're not even allowed to in most cases, um, and so you end up knowing almost enough just to make things worse, you know, yeah, yeah, um, but I, I think just be passionate about it, and just when any, whenever there's an opportunity, seize it. And 
work your butt off and you know you'll have more and more opportunities so it's mainly you know whatever job you are doing do your best exactly and then you know people you'll have a reputation for having that and that way when the right opportunity arises um, you'll be the most likely um, one chosen yeah that makes a lot of sense but do you free dive when you spearfish spearfish? yeah i'm a free dive spearfish yeah all my life i have been um, I don't do it as much anymore because I'm always so busy with this. You know, when we were doing offshore adventures, that was, you know, half spearfishing. And then we did another show called Ocean Hunter, which was basically a lot of the footage that we didn't use in offshore adventures that was, you know, same trip, different day or something. Just so can you find those online or what? Yeah, I think you can. I haven't looked for so long. Um, but we made, uh, I think, uh, 14 seasons of offshore adventures and five of Ocean Hunters maybe. Um, so how long can you hold your breath? Uh, you know, my longest ever was right there at four minutes, and I used to be able to do that fairly regularly, but I never did that when I was diving. Um, I think it's kind of works against you in a lot of ways, trying to trying to focus on how deep you go or how how long you can hold your breath. Mostly I get into a rhythm where it's like a minute and a half up, a minute and a half down, but you really want to be dropping in on the right spot yeah. mostly. And, and just being down for four minutes usually means you're hunting horizontally, and it depends what kind of fish you're after. Horizontal hunting on the, the bottom, cruising along in rocks and looking in caves is fine. But dropping in on tuna and wahoo and, and stuff like that isn't always the best way to go about it. It's nice to be above them sometimes and being able to glide down toward them. Yeah. Because any kind of horizontal movement um, requires kicking. What about a shooting Kobe off the bull shark's back? You ever do that? No, but I haven't spent. I've never shot a Kobe. I've never really. I don't, haven't spent too much time in the Atlantic spearfishing at all. Okay. Really, I mean, when I when I moved this operation to the Atlantic, I mean, I don't even have my spear guns up, you know, where I would get to them. Um, so you're not um, doing any spearfishing or anything. When I go back home, I'm still spearfishing. I'll okay. go, you know, dive white sea bass in Yellowtail and La Jolla, and um, go down into Baja California and do the same, shooting uh, Yellowtail and Grouper and Cabrilla. Um, but not not near the extent that I used to. Yeah. So what do you think the uh, biggest threat facing sharks is right now? Um, you know, I, th- I think that that's different in each part of the world. Um, the 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 way I see that the the shark finning um, being the, you know obviously probably the most danger to the population of sharks. It's it's not everywhere. It's I mean I think you know you look at United States waters. We're so well regulated that we have good populations through here, but they, they travel across borders and stuff like that from other places where they, you know... There is no regulation. Well, yeah, there are no regulations. And I, I look at that, like, when I'm traveling down through Central America and places like that, when they have those small ponga fleets, you know, 22-foot open ponga with a, with a tiller drive um, is enough for them to go out for multiple days because they don't need ice for their fins. Um, they can just, you know, throw them aboard under a burlap yeah. sack and they'll be fine, actually even dry them out. Um, I think that's where I see, you know, such a big threat to the populations of them. Yeah. So, if you could uh, give any piece of advice to kids now on saving the environment and protecting fish, I know Chris says a lot about fish sandwiches, Mm -hmm. what kind of uh, advice could you say to the children? I'd say education, because there's a lot of times you you can be really passionate about something and then still do damage to it. Um, by just a knee-jerk reaction, oh, we got to stop this and just stop that. And then it's like, well, did you really look at the impact overall of all these other things? So I, I'd just say once you're interested in, in saving the, uh, the earth, the ocean, um, doing your part, um, dig deeper, dig as deep as you can, and, and, and come up with solutions that, that everybody can get behind. Because coming up with solutions that, um, you know, 50... Five percent of the people can get behind um, doesn't really not do anything. Doesn't, yeah, you got or, or forty-five percent. I mean, you just got to have at least a majority. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the education needs to be a little easier to understand. Sometimes um, scientific papers and stuff like that are just not read by politicians or the public. So I think what we're doing here is kind of a, a cool thing in that way. Is we're making it a little easier to see the data. Yeah. Um, and open source it all. Yeah, right? open source it all exactly. There's no point in not open source, especially at this stage in the game, you know, when there's so many um, you know, threats. Yeah, desperate situations, you know. It's like you can't sit around and think, talk about it forever. you got yeah, to put some action down. Do something, yeah.